Well, good morning and welcome to another week of Journey with Christ. My name is Mark Mitchell. I'm the preaching minister at the Park Avenue Church of Christ. And I'm joined, as always, by Steve Fox, who has been a minister for over 50 years, and we are always glad to have him with us, no matter what state of condition that he's in. It's good to have you today, buddy. Thank you. Well, most people are shocked at that when you say I've preached over 50 years because just looking at me, they probably think I was 50. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, most people have to work through that. Yeah. But it's nice It's nice to be here. Um, it's nice to do these things, even though sometimes we have no idea where we're going with this. That's the fun part. Well, it's possible that they have a good idea that that's what we're <laughs> That we are, we have an outline, folks, but doesn't necessarily mean that we will, like any good man, won't find a shortcut. Not even close. <laughs> so, uh, this week, our discussion is going to be about, uh, that Steve has picked out, is the discussion of Jesus teaching man and uh, what is the circumstance of man. Am I getting that Okay. And why he's called the Son of Man. And why he's called the Son of Man. Um, I'm going to begin reading our first text this morning from John chapter 2. And I'm going to be reading from verse 23 through 25. Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Uh, I remember the first time I ever was in a class, uh, and this was when I was doing that, that men's group, and we were studying John, and we got to that, and thinking about, okay, not only is there a concept of Jesus uh, specifically says, I don't, need to te- I don't need for you to tell me what men are and what they're capable of and what they'll do. I know it all too well. Mm-hmm. That is, uh, that's kind of disconcerting. You know, trying to think that the fact that uh, even though we have a few verses that you and I have talked about a couple of times where God is surprised. I don't think he's always surprised of what we, he might be surprised of what we did, but he's never surprised of what we have the potential to do. You know, um, if it's possible for us to be extremely evil, then he knows man's capable of it. Like the flood, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Lots of things that God knows that he may not actually have. We blame God for a whole lot of things that he doesn't need blame for. That's what I'm meant to say. Absolutely. And it it seems that our concept is to to oftentimes lay blame on everything that bad happens at God. When in, uh, there's a concept in in science called proportionality. And what it means is to the, generally, anything that is made has, to the potential of good, it has the equal potential to bad. Uh, ask um, Nobel what he thought. I mean, he, there he goes and creates dynamite. And he looked at it as the good potential as to be able to move mountains and dirt and without killing people and things of that nature, but then uh, he reads that uh, obituary where they miss, you know, got the wrong man and talked about how he had created dynamite that people were using in war and so forth. And he was so, smit, you know, dumbfounded yeah. by being remembered for the evil side of dynamite as not a, as opposed to what the good side of it was. And that's the same thing with man. To the degree of the possibility of good, we have in society that same and equal degree 
of bad. I mean, it's just, it's, it can happen. We're capable of doing it. Um, and that's kind of, that's kind of scary. And what you said a little while ago about reading this verse for the first time, for he himself knew what was in man. Yeah. That's not just individuals. That's humanity in general. Human each, yeah. He knew that. He knew what we were He didn't have to have anybody answer those questions for him. And it's no wonder he might want to hesitate in trusting us. Yes. I mean, uh, everyone here knows that moment or experience where you think to yourself for a split second, I'm going to tell someone I know something. Then you think, no, nah, better not. <laughs> the potential here is pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, word gets out that I said something to someone you know, something that someone entrusted me with. So, yeah. I wonder how often, though, given the context of our discussion today, I wonder how often we aren't learning or being taught because of our inability to use it the way we should use it. Or mankind gets in the way a lot. Yes. That's what you're saying. Yeah. And I'd like to start the, uh, the larger proportion of what I want to share with the group this morning by starting with a joke that my grandmother told me. <laughs> Those of you who watch Joel Osteen, have you ever noticed when at the beginning he'll say, I always like to start out with something funny, and then he doesn't? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I'm going to put myself in the same category and run the risk, okay? The first joke I ever remember, first joke I ever remember was my grandmother telling me a joke that I just thought was hilarious. I was five or six years old probably. And she said, this little boy said to his grandma, where do people come from? And she said, well, the Bible says they come from dust. And he said, well, where do they go? And she said, well, the Bible says they go back to dust. Why'd you ask me that? He said, well, there's somebody either coming or going under my bed. <laughs> so, that, so that right there is the lifetime of a person to go from dust to, dust to dust. And so basically what that's saying is your body is highly important. Your body is very important. But there's also something else that's important, and that's what we're going to discuss in the next few minutes. The eternity side of, our, yes, of the equation? Yes, of the equation. Um, most of us as little kids, I just mentioned like when I was five or six years old, most of us as little kids walk around in, in your life, wherever that is or whatever you're doing, and people will say, who are you? Well, I'd like to have an answer to who I am. Well, mm. I, I am what my mom and dad named me. I'm Steve because, not because I picked that, I didn't choose that, my mm -hmm. mom and dad gave me that name. So that's who I am. You put the first name and the second name together and that's who you are. But after a while, as you get older, you're not satisfied with that answer because we all started asking ourselves at different ages probably, who am I? Yeah. And what am I? Mm -hmm. The who is answered pretty easily, but what, what am I? Well, I'm sure there are a few people in the state of West Virginia that you and I have had this conversation before whose name is Steve Fox also. Yes. That There's would, a golfer who's a who's golfer Steve, Steve, Steve Fox. Fox. I've gotten a lot of telephone calls. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, and there's actually two other Mark Mitchells in the state of West Virginia, both of them, one's a lawyer, one's an, a, um, works, used to work in the uh, stock brokerage part, and I was in the financial planning part, so I mean, it, the numbers, I get confused all the time, but they still weren't me. Yeah, that wasn't you. It wasn't me, I mean, th you know, more importantly, that's what people call me. It doesn't define really who I am. That's correct. I have a granddaughter named Campbell. Her name is Campbell Sidero Lunsford. <laughs> And when she started school, I said, honey, you're going to have to be real careful. And she said, why? And I said, well, you, when you get your papers back all the time, make sure, look at your name. Make sure you got the right papers. Because <laughs> there might be another Campbell, Campbell Sidero Lunsford in your class. That's who she is. 
Now, eventually, she's going to get to the point where she's going to ask, who am I, and what am I, and what am I doing here, and where am I going? Mm. Um, Jesus, on several occasions, talked about spirit and body. He talks about the fact that man is a dual creature. He has a spirit, and he has a body. And when that spirit leaves the body, the body is dead. So having that spirit in our life, and sometimes the Bible uses the word soul, uses soul and spirit interchangeably. But when Jesus uses those phrases, and I'll give you some of those phrases in just a minute, he is teaching us that man has two parts, that man is a dual being, just as Jesus had two parts. Did you ever think, think about the fact that Jesus got hungry? Well, where'd that come from? That comes from his physical body. Mm -hmm. He got hungry, he got thirsty, he certainly endured pain. He knew what emotions were like. He knew what tears were like. In um, Matthew 4, when Satan tempts him, the first temptation that Satan gives to Jesus, he answers with a, a, um, a quote, a verse from Deuteronomy, where he says, man does not live by bread alone. Yeah. He lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Man does not live by bread alone. If you just had a body, you could keep that body gone by eating bread or eating some other kinds of food. But he doesn't live by bread alone. And by the way, some of some people in our audience would probably recognize that as a minister who preached here for 42 years, for 40 years, had a radio program that was called Not By Bread Alone. And some of you may have heard Jerry Alderson do that for... Uh, on mm -hmm. the north side of 40 years, which is which is pretty impressive. Yes. Today, uh, Joey Pauley, the preacher at Bell, is um, doing the same thing that Jerry did. And then when Jerry moved him to Nashville, Joey took over, took over that program. Not by bread alone is a very, very interesting concept because what Jesus is teaching us is we all feed the body. I guarantee you, yeah. Everybody that's listening to us ate breakfast this morning. It might have been a Pop-Tart or it might have been a full meal, but we all ate breakfast because man does not live by bread alone. We also should be feeding our spirit and our soul, and that's what Jesus was teaching us. There were two parts to that concept. I'm a body, a physical body, and I'm also a spirit, a soul, and both of those came from God. Yeah, um... And you wonder sometimes, and I've actually heard this from the pulpit, if you didn't feed, if you fed your uh, flesh as much as you fed your spirit, you would be anorexic. You'd be, <laughs> you know, because... You'd probably be on life support. You'd be like on life support because for the most part, that's one of the areas that we struggle. And maybe it is because what you're talking about here that, you know, we need to keep in mind the duality of the life that the, of who we are, we're not like other animals on the planet. Uh, when you first talked about that, I, my first thought was going. My head was like a deer. A deer is looking for water and grass, and that's just and protect, yeah. and staying safe. Yeah, that's about all that's in their programming, you know. Uh, and but yet, humankind has the ability to decide so many various uh, paths. And God knows, going back to what he told Adam and Eve, that he's going to make man in his, in his own kind, in his own image. Like, in own image. And that, that they would be capable of discernment and coming up with a decision as to whether it was what they should do or they shouldn't do. Just look at two birds in the forest and they're talking to each other and one says, what do you want to do today? Well, let's eat grass and find some worms. Well, we did that yesterday. Well, let's eat grass and find some worms. Well, what do we do the day before? And what are we going to do tomorrow? But man, God has put man in a situation where he can do so many other things mentally and sometimes physically yeah. that that's why in Genesis 1 and 2, man is elevated even to the point where Moses would write, he's made in the image of God. Now, I don't know exactly what that means, but that means he's more important and he's better off than the animals. Mm -hmm. And 
God's given him the ability to, again, to discern what is, what's my role today, tomorrow, next week. Now, since you and I are part of that mankind, what happens when mankind messes it up? What did Jesus say in Mark chapter 7? I'm just going there, verse 21 through 23. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Um, Man has two parts. Yeah. A good part and a bad part. I remember growing up, and this was back in the uh, early part of the 70s, but it was when Flip Wilson had first come out with his show, and and he would do this routine, and he'd come up, the devil made, made me do, do it. it. And I remember thinking to myself, well, you know, that same guy's near me too. I don't know why he talks me into these things, you know. Thinking to myself that... Uh, that it's possible for me to be influenced to where I have end up with no decision in it. You know, it's sort of like God made me do that or devil made me do that. But in truth, Jesus says all these evils come from inside. They're already in there. Going back to your our first discussion there from John chapter 3, that's Jesus already knows what's inside of us and what's inside of us has the potential for some serious evil. I think all of us at times have thought about life being a trap. Mm -hmm. You know, God put us here. We didn't ask to be born. We didn't yeah. ask to be born to those parents. We didn't ask to live in a certain place or go to a certain high school. We didn't ask for any of that, what, what color skin we are. Mm -hmm. Nobody asked for that. And I, sometimes I think we, we all of us deal with a, this concept that I feel like I'm in a trap. And when, when Mark quotes all these things that Jesus says, those things come out of a man, I have to try to figure out, is that, is that God working through me or is that me working through me? Well, according to verse 23, those are me. It's got some, we've got some things in there we've got to work on. They come from inside of me. I mean, uh, now I, you could... There are many who have the argument, well, if God put them in there, then it must be okay. But in truth, they weren't put in there. I mean, it was the minute we ate. That comes from the fall. That comes from the fall. That concept of brokenness, that concept of sin, uh, as Paul talked about all the way from Romans 1 through 7, all the aspects of sin that reveals itself, and so much of it as Jesus does when... He's talking to some of the Pharisees and they're talking about washing of hands and how they defile themselves by not getting their hands clean. Jesus says, you think bread's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Do you think dirt and germs are, is an issue for you? I'm good. I wash my hands. Yeah. No, it's what's already inside of you. He said, what comes out the mouth yeah. is what defiles you and I, not what goes in the mouth. <laughs> But that list that you just read, it's it's astonishing. But we Scary. all know we all know people like that. We, we probably know people that characterize the entire list. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't have to go very far. But we're going no <laughs> about six feet away. Yeah, I got one. <laughs> Me. So let's look at one other passage that um, that Jesus said was significant about man and about his humanity and about our humanity. It's found in Matthew 16, and we will begin at verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his own soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? 
For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of the Father, and then he will repay every man for what he has done. And then Jesus gives a genealogy, I mean a chronology verse here in verse 28. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, we could talk about that last verse for an hour and a half, so I want to go back to <laughs> what, what Jesus said about losing things. Yeah, You can gain the whole world, but if you lose your own soul, you're a loser. You lost the one thing that's supposed to be at the top of the list. I think all of us understand a little bit about what it means and, and the trauma that we go through when we lose something. Um, have you ever lost your wallet? <laughs> you remember very specifically here when I came one Sunday night and I couldn't find my wallet, my keys. Losing your wallet and losing your keys is just absolutely awful. They have them more and often now for me. When Susie and I go to Nicaragua, I walk around half the day going, passport wallet, passport wallet. Okay, it's there. Pass and if, you, if I would ever lose that in Nicaragua, my wallet and my passport, oh, it would be devastating. awful, devastating. So here, Jesus said, what if you lose your soul? What if you forfeit your life? Lose your wallet, lose your keys. Um, but what if you lost your, lose your car? I told you a little bit ago about trying to find my car in a mall one time. I knew somebody stole it. I knew somebody stole it. And it was right there, the same place I put it before I went in the mall. Yeah, but we get turned around. The next thing you know, we, much like... Was it, was it that color or was it that number? Or what was it three green or four blue? Or I don't know where I was. Well, much, much like the rest of humanity... I get confused on what's really important and what's not important, too. Uh, I mean, not to say that not finding your car is not important, but I misplace what's the priorities in my life just like I misplaced that car. Uh, because sometimes I think, you know, um, jobs, um, stuff, places, vacations, all these things take priority and Jesus point blank says if you're not willing to lose all of this stuff mm -hmm. and follow me you're going to lose the very thing that you're trying to hold on to yeah but if you let it go and hold on to this I'll give you more than just I'll give you a reward at all it, all these other things you're wanting will come along with it but you got to know which one to hold on to first. And the sad thing is it makes us into idiots sometimes because, like when we go to the beach, I take my keys and my wallet and I stuff them down in my shoes. Yeah. Because nobody's, nobody would look there. Yeah. <laughs> nobody would look there. But it's, it's not like every other person on the <laughs> beach has stuck their keys in their wallet. It makes us so irrational. I mean, but um, when you lose something, it's just... You know, it plays with your brain. In, in the case of, you said, like losing your keys, I've lost my keys on several occasions, and you stick your hand in your pocket about 25 times. Like, okay, this like is it's go, it's going to be there now. They're there now. Or you go look for them in the refrigerator. You start looking in places that are just crazy. No, I found some keys one time in the refrigerator. Don't, don't even go there. So Jesus compares this to a lot of other things. He says, what if you gain the whole world? What if you, money-wise, have everything? Have it all. What if you academically have it all? Are you willing and, to give and it up? Are you willing to give it up for your soul? Uh, if you win the World Series, that's not as important as winning your soul. No. If you play middle linebacker for Ohio State, if you do that and lose your own soul, it's not worth it. If you win the Boston Marathon, if you win the Heisman Trophy, there are all kinds of accolades that human beings give other human beings where Jesus says, those aren't the important things. And think about this. What does it require of you to trade? What all do you have to trade in your life to gain what you, all those things you just mentioned? You and I both know to win the Boston Marathon would take tremendous amounts of hour, time, devotion, physical assertion, training, I mean, all the, not counting talent, 
that will go with it, the stamina. You're not going to, nobody just going to do that. You're going to have to exchange some things in your life to gain that. You don't walk out of the house one morning and say, I got a good idea. I think I'll go run to Boston Marathon. <laughs> I think I got a shot. Yeah. And every one of those things, we would, we would demand, if we wanted something so bad, we would demand the effort to go with it. Do you think Jesus is saying, you know, you're going to have to demand, you're going to have to demand the effort out of yourself too if you want some of this other stuff? And if you look at the concept that we started with right at the beginning, man has two parts. That's right. He has a body and he has a soul. soul. And, and we're going to talk about that more in some advanced classes that are good glass presentations that we use in here. But Jesus was saying that there are certain things that come about because of your body, but there are also certain things that come about because of the spirit that's within you, the soul that's within you. And you want to live your life in such a way that you don't lose that thing, that thing no. that God put in you. So one of these days we're going to study First Thessalonians 5:23. I know it's not what Jesus taught, but First Thessalonians 5:23 said Paul said, I, "I'm praying for your body, spirit, and soul. soul." So he does make a differentiation between the spirit and the soul. I think that's sometimes hard to, kind of difficult to grasp a hold of, but at the same time. He is saying you are a two-part person. Mm. You have a physical body and you have a spiritual soul. Now, what's going to happen to that? If I mm. obey God or if I don't obey God? We'll talk about that in future future. I'm going to be gone that week. <laughs> yeah. I want to share um, this. This is, you know, s s sometimes some things in life just make you stop and think about things that you haven't thought about for a while. And, oh, this happened maybe 15 years ago, 15, 16 years ago. Susie and I were in Managua, Nicaragua, the capital of Nicaragua, and we were working at a children's clinic. And the second or third day there, we were on a break, and they have no paved roads, no concrete, no concrete roads. They just have, in this section where we were, they just have dirt roads. Mm -hmm. And... So I kind of looked out the window, and we were on a break, and I went around to the side door and watched about 10 kids playing baseball out in, the, out in that road, in that alley. And I just stood there and watched them for a little bit. And uh, after about 10 minutes, I started to go back into the clinic. And I thought, you know what? I don't have this opportunity very often. I'm going to give this a shot. So I went over there and started talking to the pitcher in Spanish, and I asked him, is it okay if I try to hit? And he said, oh, yeah. And all the boys, all the kids, were, you know, they were little, 10, 11, 12. They were all going, oh, yeah, like, you know, the Yankees going to hit, the gringo, the gringo is going to hit now. <laughs> so he hand, the one guy at the plate, which was a Frisbee, by the way, he walked over and handed me the bat, and I walked over towards the Frisbee. And as I walked over there, I said, dear Lord, don't let me embarrass myself. Please, don't let me be embarrassed. Let me show these kids what a, what a real Yankee can do. So I got up there, and I was shaking a little bit. I was not fully confident in what I was about ready to do. Well, the pitcher just grooved one for me, threw it real slow and threw it right down the middle of the Frisbee, right down the middle of the plate, and I crushed that thing. And it went over the two outfielders that were the deepest, went over their heads and it hit that dirt road and it rolled and it rolled and it rolled. And I saw it disappear, just disappeared like crazy. Well, a couple of the boys ran over there and one of them held the other kid by his legs and he took the top of the sewer drain off and the kid reached down in there and got that ball and threw it back up, put the top on the put the top on the drain again. And I thought, why in the world would you do that? You know why I did that? You know why he did that? No. He had one ball. Yeah. That's what they were playing with. And it wasn't really a baseball. It was something that they centered and then put a bunch of tape around it and make it look like a ball. But they had a ball. 
And one lose it. ball, and they were not going to lose that. If they'd had 10 balls, 15 balls, I would have gone. They, for it. they wouldn't have held Ricky down in here so he could grab a hold of and throw it back up there. No, they would not have you done can that. Have that ball. Yeah, gunner. you can keep that one. Sewer. And I got thinking. That's what Jesus tried to teach us. You have one soul. Yeah. And you need to take care of it, and you need to follow him and try as closely as you can to follow his rules and to follow the concepts and precepts that you find in the New Testament because mm. he's the one who can help you save your soul. He's, yeah. he's the one who can make sure that you don't lose it. He said if you gain everything else in the world lose and lose your own soul, you, you missed it. Yeah. Um, well, that's a great story. Thank you very much. Um, I won't I won't forget that. I was thinking that the line was going to be something to the context of uh, <laughs> I was to blame for us losing the ball, you know. Uh, there were a couple times I played out there where I hit it on somebody's house along the sides of the streets and uh, people would come out on their porch and say something about it so I quit doing that. I, I let them, yeah. I got the pitch and I let them yeah. Hit, hit it up on somebody's roof. Yeah, let them be the one who held us accountable. <laughs> well, I hope everyone has enjoyed this time that we've had together with Steve and I as we talk about the various topic, topics that can assist us live in the life that we're living in, in this secular world, because it is so confusing. Satan is always out there. And as Jesus so well put it, he knows what's inside of us. He knows what we need. But we're going to be wise enough to choose the right thing. So in the coming weeks and months, I, I challenge you to keep in mind you have one soul and you have, you have one opportunity here on this earth to take it full advantage of the situation before you. Don't put it off. You never know when this thing could be over for you. I invite you to be back next week. I'll be short one, but I have a replacement. Uh, Sean will be hopefully filling in for Steve. Steve's going to be going out of town. So uh, look forward to seeing you then. And as always, we ask that you continue to remember those who are in need, those who are battling the coronavirus and the various things that's going on in our world. From Steve and I, have a blessed day. Thank you.